All right, peace and love. How y'all doing? This is Zaza Ali. Today is March, let me make sure, <laughs> March 27, 2022. I pray that this message reaches you all in the best of health, spirit, and mind. Pardon me, I'm just closing out some of the um <clears throat> The form, the pages on my other on my other um, computer screen. So, what's good? How y'all doing? Um, this is going to be a short presentation uh, for the specific subject matter is becoming light in your affairs, um, and this is you know a message for anyone that should happen to hear this particular presentation. But it's also a promotion for my uh, a course that I'm launching, The Sovereignty of Self, a 90-day course specifically for women, 10 women, um, just to be more specific. But this particular video is going to touch on some of the things that I'm going to be working with the women uh, as far as it, the course is concerned, some of the things we're going to work on together. But these are also, um, you know, tools and kind of things that I've learned as time has passed through life, uh, but specifically working with personal clients, um, which I do, which this particular course is a, a microcosm of the, you know, the bigger, the broader course that I do with individuals. So today we're going to specifically talk about the topic, becoming light in your affairs. Um, I don't want anyone to be dissuaded because this is, I'm promoting a course for women, but this particular subject matter is, will apply to everyone. And it is dealing with, you know, how to kind of maintain your sanity and still thrive uh, with everything that's going on in the world. So if you have purchased a book from me within the last two years, you have received a copy of this flyer on the right hand side. Um, that's one side of the flyer promotes my books and different things that I do. But there are four specific things that I recommend for people who are trying to thrive in times of uncertainty. Um, the one that we're going to focus on specifically today is fine tune your physical and mental diet become light in all areas it improves our ability to adjust or navigate circumstances so we're going to really hone in on that um, in this particular presentation to today and then um, as far as the other things that i kind of recommend become more spiritually in tune create breathwork regiments spend time in nature and develop a personal form of meditation or prayer these are all things that don't require money or don't require success or fame or you know, you can do these things and apply these things no matter where you are in your, your life or in your personal development. Um, let go of anyone or anything that is not serving your best interests. That kind of goes without saying, however, how many of us actually live with that intention. Uh, and then lastly, spend time alone. This is important. Even as we have families and businesses and worlds that depend on us, it is imperative that we have time alone without intrusion. This is when we are able to hear the messages that come to and through us from the spiritual realm. So I'm going to, you know, delve into all of those subject matters in this particular course with these women more at length. But today we're just going to talk about becoming light in all areas. All right. <clears throat> it approves our ability to adjust or navigate circumstances. So first, I want to start off by, you know, really acknowledging and emphasizing this, this notion that dissatisfaction brings change. That can apply obviously on an individual level. You know, you're in a relationship that with a person that is not, uh, you know, serving you well, the relationship, you know, you're stagnated, you're not growing or it's dysfunctional or it's abusive. Um, obviously that goes for the male, men and women. Um, there's only so long that you can settle into something that is not watering you or growing or nurturing you or helping you to evolve before you start to become dissatisfied. And I think, you know, this, the idea of depression, right. And what a, a lot of us are identifying as mental illness is the ramifications of people living with complete dissatisfaction. Right. So if I say dissatisfaction brings change 
And then we can also admit that there are people who are stuck in stagnated jobs or careers or businesses or relationships or just, you know, un unhealthy, um, you know, inability to make quality choices and decisions, right? So some people get stuck in these spaces and because they don't have an out, they conform to the dissatisfaction. So I want to make sure that I emphasize that because, you know, everybody doesn't change. Some people die depressed. You know what I mean? Some people hold on to stagnant relationships for five, 10, 15, 20 years and die in a, you know, undeveloped and unevolving relationship, right? So human beings have free will. We can stay in dissatisfaction, but um, for the course, the, 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 you know, for the sake of this particular conversation on an individual level and then collectively, which is what I really want to emphasize, you know, the extreme polarities that we're all witnessing right now on our planet cannot, you know, we can't just sit back and, and think that these things are not going to cause ripple waves in the universe, so to speak, right? So all this, this, this anger and this vitriol and this bitterness and this lack-based consciousness, fear-based consciousness, it leaves us and it emanates out into the universe and then it goes into the ethers and then it ripples back, right? So, you know, there's the, there's the individual self and what's happening in your personal world. And then there's the collective consciousness and, and how we're all vibrating and thinking and feeling right? And the universe is taking into account all of those things, but we actually are creating our reality, right? Individually, how you're thinking and feeling is what's creating your day-to-day, -day, uh, um, you know, relationships and conversations, communications, experiences, and collectively, the same thing is true, right? So I just want to really emphasize and be mindful that in the bigger scheme of things, yes, we know change is coming, right? Because there's so much dissatisfaction and, and extreme polarities and, you know, dysfunction happening on our planet at one given time. But in your personal life, I just really want to emphasize, don't get stuck in dissatisfaction, right? If you wake up in the morning and you're dissatisfied, and then you go to work and you're dissatisfied, or you have a business that is very dissatisfying and a relationship that's dissatisfying, right? There has to be some glimmer of inspiration and enthusiasm and invigorating, you know, in terms of how you're living your life on a day-to-day -day basis, or else you're gonna be continuously creating and recreating these dissatisfied experiences in your world and in your environment. So going with the flow versus creating the flow. Most of the people that we know, perhaps most of the people watching this video are going with the flow. They're reacting to what the news is saying. They're reacting to what's happening on social media. They're reacting to what their friends and their family are doing without actually thinking outside of the box, having a mind of your own, right? So just completely going with the flow of whatever is happening in the world. Well, these times are very dangerous to be going with the flow because the direction that the world is going in is not healthy. <laughs> it's not, you know, the, the levels of depression and anxiety and, and dissatisfaction that people are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you magnify that or you multiply that times what, 5 billion, 6 billion, 7 billion, depending on your vantage point, right? So our goal, instead of going with the flow, which is where most people are, is to create the flow. And I wanna ask you, and I'm mindful of this myself all the time, how much time are you spending on a day-to-day -day basis in your life where you are 100% focus on one particular thing, something that is growing you and expanding you and making you feel alive and making you feel valuable and needed and necessary in these times, right? 
So creating the flow means having goals and desires and wants that you are working towards. And I don't just mean pounding the pavement. I've worked hard. I don't believe in hard work because <laughs> I've worked hard, right? And I've also had uh, greater successes when I was working smart, but doing things that I actually love to do and putting my space myself in a zone and really honing in on the things that bring value and joy to my personal life, right? So creating the flow. The visionaries are gonna be the ones that are gonna create this new world. The people that can separate themselves from the chaos and from the madness of what's happening around them and still be able to lock in and focus on something that makes them feel alive and, and, and unique and special, right? We're here to create. So creating the flow, how you want your life to look, how you want it to feel. The creative force, and this is really what the Sovereignty of Self course, which I'm launching uh, specifically for 10 women, um, we're gonna really hone in on that creative force and allowing ourselves to step outside of the normal routines. You see this video is supposed to keep replaying. Um, maybe I didn't set it up right, but allowing ourselves to step outside of the normal routines and like the, the rudimentary every day, you know, kind of get up, do what you gotta do. And this pattern that we repeat on a day-to-day -day basis and really starting to get back into the mindset of the creative. We're here to create. We're not here to work jobs, although we work jobs because we, we have to pay the bills and take care of our responsibilities. Um, we're not just here to be dictated to and told what to do and told how to think and told how to live. We have to get out of this box. Even it's always surprising to me how many people ask me when I'm discussing things you know, that I've been researching or talking about for 10 or 15 years, well, we're tired of hearing about the problem. What's the solution? Well, the onus is on you to create solutions. I'm, I research a subject and, and <laughs> bring you information as well as resources that can help you to navigate, you know, landmines, so to speak, and you're still depending on me for the solution. You are the solution. And the way that we create solutions and create worlds and create realities is by being creative, right? So for you to ask yourself and for me to ask myself individually and then collectively, what are we actually creating and bringing into third dimensional reality that's going to expand the consciousness of our loved ones, our families, and to expand the consciousness of this, this planet, which is extremely stagnant right now with creative energy. And now we're talking about immersing people that are dealing with anxiety and dissatisfaction and uh, depression. Now we're talking about creating new worlds and new states of consciousness that don't deal with any of the issues that these people are, are dealing or facing. It's creating a new way to live vicariously outside into an, in another world outside of the world that they know, right? So when we talk about metaverse, when we talk about virtual reality, which you know, I'm not against those things, but I think we have some things that we need to talk about and deal with before we start you know, making people feel safe uh, and, and not just safe, but comfortable with staying in their houses and tapping into virtual worlds and virtual realities that don't really exist. That's only going to exasperate the problems of the heart, the problems of the mind, and the problems that people are suffering from, right? So we have human consciousness, which is our day-to-day -day reality, thinking about our family, thinking about you know, our children, you know, paying bills, working jobs, um, dealing with the day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, reality of being a human being, your health, your mindset, um, you know, the physical day-to-day -day things that you have to do, the way that we interact in the world. And then we have organic and divine consciousness, right? Being tapped into and tuned into nature, having a connection with a higher state of consciousness. Uh, you know, meditation is all about taking us out of the individual self and putting us into the mindset of the collective, right? So looking at humanity 
as one opposed to me in here and them out there, right? And then just the harmony um, and the understanding that comes when you start to intentionally connect with nature, right? Trying to understand this concept of God or divinity or Allah or whatever your concept of a spiritual awareness is. I don't have an issue with any of them. As long as it's giving you personal power, I'm all for it. The problem is that most of the religions are not giving people personal power. They're teaching them to be followers. And so we have billions of people around the world now that have been catered to being followers. And of course, you know, YouTube followers, Facebook followers, Instagram followers, right? Metaverse followers, right? So we are not arming humanity with the tools and the resources to elevate them in their personal power. That's what the organic and divine consciousness is. If I see you as a reflection of the creator, then I should be able to deal with you and to engage you from the mindset of the creator, right? From the vantage point of the creator. So parents can understand the level of, of love and sacrifice that it takes to you know, completely dedicate yourself to another human being, regardless of the fact that they can't really give you anything in return besides love. And then, you know, <laughs> you have a teenager, you know, that, that goes through its ups and downs. But, you know, children are, are very selfish um, for the first 18 of their uh, years of their lives, for sure. Yes, they love us and they're, they're cute and bubbly and funny and fun, but that relationship is not a reciprocal relationship for the most part until they grow into adulthood. And obviously there are you know, exceptions to every rule, but I'm saying that to say that the organic and divine nature of who we are is always reciprocal. Nature is always loving. It's always welcoming, right? It just depends on where you are in your perspective on how you see that. Now, if you're in Hawaii, you know, and a volcano is erupting, you might feel some type of way about that. But in the bigger scheme of things, the, the, the process of the volcanic eruptions and even the ash, uh, the plumes of ash that go up into the upper atmosphere, they have a very strategic and scientific purpose on this planet. So I don't want to get too far, go too far left into that, but all things work for the greater good, right? And then you have universal consciousness. If they say that there are, you know, hundreds of millions of galaxies and that we live in one galaxy, there's been a lot of talk about unidentified flying objects and about, you know, beings from other continents and planets and whatnot. Um, and then you look at the solar system, right? You look at the way stars die and, and, and you know, how for eons of time, People have been guided and, and, and built civilizations based on the star system, right? So we have pyramids that can be linked all across this planet that not only in Africa, but that span through America, um, South America, that are in alignment with the heavens, meaning they are a map they show a map or a replica of what's happening in the heavens, right? So as much as people today call ancient civilizations primitive, they were much more advanced when it came to working to be in alignment with universal consciousness. I mean, look at the Dogon tribe and, and Sirius B, right? How people in this modern these modern times would, you know, judge or assess those cultures. But how is it possible that they could say that their ancestors came from a star that you can't even see with the human eye, right? And so this is what we're really going to be honing in on today, but also in the Sovereignty of Self 90-Day Course for Women, we're really going to talk about the connection or the correlation between human consciousness and then orga organic and divine consciousness and then universal consciousness. Because again, how do we thrive in times of uncertainty? We're going to have to get out of this linear, you know, it's all about me, me against the world type of perspective. In order to thrive moving forward, 22, 22 beyond, you're going to have to be living in cohesion with nature, emanating love, right? 
not loving your enemies, but emanating love, operating from a vibration and a standard perspective of love, expecting love everywhere you go, which means you have to give it love everywhere you go, not to people that hate you. If you're operating in the right frequency, you're not going to be constantly running into chaos and and, and dysfunction at every turn anyway. And if you're worried about that, then you're definitely not living in alignment uh, with divine consciousness or your higher self. So just to kind of you know, bring this to a consensus, um, natural law is a theory that says that all humans inherit, perhaps through a divine presence, a universal set of moral rules that govern human conduct. And I'll even go a step further. That's the you know kind of dictionary definition. But natural law, in my opinion, means that we all have a divine right to food, clothing, and shelter. We all have a divine right to feel protected and guided, to feel safe. We all have a divine right to the basic necessities that our planet provides, right? We all have that divine right regardless to how much money you have, regardless to where you come from, what your background or what your family upbringing looks like. Is that the reality of this world? No. That's why there are such high levels of dissatisfaction. That's why change is on the way. Man's law, legal system, court system, transportation system, educational system, penal system, governments. And man's law is basically, especially at this time, you know, the main infrastructure and the main PowerPoint, if you will, for how people are living their lives. Oh, mandates are being lifted. Now I can go travel again. I can be happy again. Two years miserable, couldn't find any semblance of peace. But now that mandates are being lifted, now you know there's this um, inorganic and inauthentic, you know, uh, uh, going back to the drawing board of dissatisfaction. Now it's like putting lipstick on a pig. There's this huge elephant in the room and nobody's really talking about it. Everybody's kind of dancing around it, right? So there's man's law, there's natural law, and then there's learning how to listen to your own soul, governing self, the sovereignty of self. So learning how to live in cohesion with these three different aspects of our existence is the purpose of this particular course, but this is something that we're all gonna have to be mindful and conscientious of because man's law, the legal system, court system, educational, government, transportation, where will we be or what will become of us if these things start to destroy themselves? And being in a state of mind where you feel comfortable and confident and strong in where you stand Regardless, because you understand that natural law is the real governing force of this planet and that governing yourself and listening to your own soul. So being in alignment with what your inner being is telling you to do, that nagging spirit or that nagging feeling that's talking to you that you haven't yet learned how to discern because you haven't been spiritually focused, right? You don't understand the power of your emotional countenance that when you're feeling happy and when you feel alive and when you feel love and, and elated about life, that you're in alignment with God or universal consciousness and awareness. And when you feel angry and bitter and jealous hearted and depressed and hateful and vengeful, that you are out of alignment and that you're going to continue to create those things in your day-to-day -day process or in your day-to-day -day life, I should say. So becoming light in your affairs. Mentally, you have an energetic resonance, energetic resonance. So mentally, some people wake up, they're more prone to be, um, you know, positive, more prone to, you know, think good about the day. And then you have other people that wake up that are in a piss poor, you know, pessimistic type of mindset. Right? How do you become light in your affairs mentally? Spiritually, there are some people who are, are operating from the frequency of gratitude and abundance, which those are terms of spirituality. They're, those are not new age concepts or, you know, this whole, the, the vibrate higher um, 
kind of culture that has been created in metaphysics and spiritual, um, um, you know, the corner, spiritual corners of the world um, that I think haven't really given a lot of people the notion of what that means in their personal lives. It sounds good, but what does that really mean, right? How do you become light spiritually? How do you become dense spiritually? What does that even mean? Emotionally, right? Your mood. How quickly are you upset by things that are taking place around you? Because, you know, there's chaos happening in the world. Do you have the emotional and the mental fortitude when the time comes to turn the world off and to turn into yourself? How to be still and be silent in order to, you know, manifest or to understand spiritual downloads that are, that are taking place when they come through, right? That's why I talked about before learning how to be alone. A lot of people don't know how to be alone. A lot of people are not comfortable with themselves, with the, with the way that they talk to themselves. So they smoke a lot or they drink a lot, right? Avoidance of self, physically becoming light in your affairs. I know some people who are raw vegans or who, you know, live by a quote unquote alkaline diet that have some of the worst energy that you could ever imagine. You would never think that someone who focuses so much on what they put in their body could be so, uh, you know, distasteful or such a turnoff in conversation, have such a bad reputation with other people for being mean spirited or what I call, you know, black heart, green diet, black heart. So becoming light in your affairs physically is not just about the food that you put in your body. So density is defined as the degree of compactness of a substance, right? So let me drink some water. Normally when we think about density, we think about, let's say New York is very dense, right? there is a very high uh, population of people living in a very small area. That's density, right? It's a lot of people kind of stuffed into a small area. Um, sometimes we think about dens density in terms of body weight, right? Obesity would be a, 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 a you know, good way to describe physical density in terms of the physical body, right? So being that we've all experienced very high levels of trauma and mental and psychological abuse under the, the scope of this, this last two years. And please understand it's been nothing less than extreme trauma and mental and psychological abuse that has been inflicted on every single human being that lives on this planet that is a wide, that has been paying attention. And God bless the people in the corners of the world that haven't seen any of it, because you know, you are blessed. Um, even though, you know, I think that there's, there can be a drawback to that too. I don't watch the news, but I definitely pay attention to what's happening in the world. Right. Um, but mental density under the scope of fear based consciousness, which is what this, this planet and most of the people I would say are operating from a very dense fear based consciousness, but that looks like depression. It looks like anxiety, overthinking, the inability to control thoughts fear-based consciousness and the inability to make decisions, right? Now you can't measure mental density. You can measure physical density. You can't measure mental density. So when I work with clients, I refer to this as these cobwebs, cobwebs that are kind of sitting in the back of our, our brain or our mind, so to speak, cluttered space or lack of space all these different club, cluttered elements of worry and fear and self-sabotage and self-doubt, they start to accumulate in the brain, right? And you know, if you understand how neurology works and every time you think a thought, especially if it's a new thought, it fires off, uh, uh, um, it fires off a spark, right? But if you're living in fear and lack-based consciousness, your brain is not firing off sparks. It's dull, it's heavy, and it's dense, right? So it's not operating from that light-based consciousness. It's operating in the darkness, so to speak. 
Becoming light mentally, going back to our subject, looks like doing things outside of the norm. If you do everything the same way every day and then every weekend, your weekends look the same, you're not firing off new neurons. We're here to create. Are you creating new thoughts? Are you being challenged mentally by going to new environments and considering the way other people live or things that aren't in the normal capacity of your day-to-day -day time frame, right? So becoming like mentally means doing things outside of the norm. It means immersion in a subject that you love. I love history. So I'm writing a history textbook right now. And when I'm doing, focusing on this work without being 10 other places at one time, it brings me a lot of joy. It brings me a lot of joy to think about um, and to research you know, the science of God, so to speak. You, these universal concepts in the way that the body and, and the brain works. I'm a nerd, right? <laughs> so these are things that bring me joy. And then having something to focus on where you are 100% focused. And ask yourself that question. What do I do? Or what do I have a program or an exercise or a ritual or a meditation or spiritual practice where I'm 100% focused on being present? For me, the things that I just talked about in my work, as well as yoga, as well as when I walk the beach, you know, I, my walks are meditations. So I'm 100% focused in the moment, right? Not intentionally not thinking about emails or not thinking about conversations I had or what I had to do later, right? So that's being 100% present. Taking herbs like ginkgo and ginseng to sharpen memory and increase mental focus. And I say that because, you know, we're so inundated with technology our air is toxic. The food is, is, you know, it's very difficult now. I know, you know, we can buy organic, but unfortunately, because of the, the toxins that are being sprayed in our air, which is in our water and in our food, um, we have to do additional things in order to supplement, you know, our bodies and our brains operating at a high capacity. So I take gin, uh, ginkgo and uh, red ginseng, red Korean ginseng every day right? So that my mind can stay sharp. Because my mind is a big part of my world. <laughs> you know, I'm a thinker, you know what I mean? I, I use my mind for everything. My business, my clients, my workshops, everything that I do, my books, it is all centered around my brain operating at a high capacity. And plus, in my meditations, I am actively seeking to be in alignment with the with the divine mind right the all the, the all in all so i want my brain to be sharp and my mind to be sharp so that there's no um you know no issues uh when it comes to me you know sort of bridging that gap so doing things outside the norm immersion in a subject that you love having something specific to focus on 100 percent and then ginkgo and ginseng are just two of my recommendations because we don't want our minds to feel heavy. We don't want thinking to feel burdensome, right? You, you can think your way out of anything. I tell my son that all the time. You can think yourself out of anything. The question is, have you primered and prepped your brain and your mind to be able to do so? We want to start preparing mentally and spiritually for what's for what is going to take to thrive during these times. The balance of awareness and focus forward. So being aware of what's happening in the world and in the surround in our surroundings, but then also your intentions and your mindset and your thought process and your feeling process has to be continuously creating a reality for you outside of the scope of this world. So focusing forward, what do you want your world to look like? What do you want it to feel like? Spiritual density. I'm only gonna let this video play for just a second, just to make the point. And then I'm gonna stop it because if I look at it too long, it'll start making me feel sick. Spiritual density looks like depression, shallow breathing, fear-based consciousness, living ostracized and separated from the world, 
lack-based consciousness, weight loss and weight gain, and a loss of spark for life. Now, let me stop this because we're not trying to do no hypnotherapy. Um, so being spiritually dense, depression, you're, you know, Jim Carrey said your avatars look, your, what did he say? Your, you're looking at your avatar that you've created to, to live in this world and you don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to wear the mask anymore. I don't want to be the avatar anymore. And I don't know how to get out of this. So I'm just going to stop everything. Right. So at, when I say that we're here to create, if you're not actually actively creating, that is, in my opinion, one of the leading causes for depression. And when I say actively creating, that can mean some people create in the mind, right? Um, when I created this, this course and these, these different things that I do to work with clients, I'm creating in the mind. I create worksheets and exercises and, and, you know, and different things that complement and supplement the program, but it's coming from my mind, right? Physically creating with your hands, that goes without saying. Emotionally creating. I mean, this is what the whole uh, um, science, well, it should be, <laughs> the science of life coaching, the science of, you know, um, psychology, working with people who need specific help or specific services. It should be done from a emotional love-based frequency. Unfortunately, it's not, which is why we have so much despair um, on our planet. But, and then spiritually creating, you know, and that's gonna look and feel different for everyone. Um, when I do yoga classes and, you know, I don't teach yoga, but I have led many classes um, in retreats or uh, in different, you know, on videos, I've done it with my clients, right? I believe that that is a, a means of creating, you know, spiritual building blocks, so to speak. Sticking an asana, getting a pose right, being able to, you know, formulate your body to do all of these different difficult asanas and postures, right? Same thing in, in martial arts. I think martial arts, when it's done properly, is a very spiritual uh, practice, right? So, you know, that can go a lot of different ways. You know, you can kill a man with your hands if you need to. I didn't want to take it there, especially from the spiritual perspective. But I'm just saying, that, you know, human beings are, are multi-layered, right? We have so many different layers. And most of us are living in this very shallow, basic sort of mindset, which is why I think the world is where it is right now. Shallow breathing. Your breath is your connection to the cosmos. Your breath is life. Everything that's living on this planet has to breathe and take in oxygen, right? So if 60 to 80% of the world's population is breathing shallow, which I believe they are, might be higher than that, but you're not really operating at the highest capacity in terms of tapping into that spiritual consciousness and spiritual awareness going back to the universal consciousness right breathing can bring you out of anything breathing can bring you out of anxiety out of depression out of fear right so if the breath is one of the the main factors that can bring you into a higher state of consciousness if it can bring you out of a low what if you're constantly if your breath work regimen is a way of life to where you don't even have to take those low dips, right? So now you, you, you're living it from a higher place, but you're still cultivating your breath. You can only go up, you can only expand and you can only go higher, right? Fear-based consciousness, I say fear is anti-God. I don't believe that God needs any of us to be fearful. I think the Bible, in the Bible it says, um, fear of God is the, is the beginning of wisdom or something to, the, to that effect the beginning of wisdom. You know, at, there was a certain point in time when I wanted my son to fear me, not because I, I was trying to be a totalitarian, but because if he stays, you know, if he has that fear factor, then he'll stay in line. I don't have to go up to the school all the time and deal with parent-teacher conferences because he knows that there's repercussions, right? But at now, my son's 18. Do I want him to fear me now? No. <laughs> 
I don't want him operating from a fear-based consciousness. I want him to feel open and welcome to come and discuss things with me. So, uh, you know, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But do I think that God or, or universal consciousness wants us to be living in fear? Absolutely not. I think religion has, has played a very prominent role in, you know, transferring fear of God to transferring fear of government. You went from fearing God to now fearing, you know what I'm saying, what your president and what your local politician is telling you to do or to not do. Living ostracized and separated from the world. And this is important, particularly in the black community because we have an underlying uh, way of operating that's, that's, that is centered around trusting no one. I don't trust nobody. How many times have you heard that, right? Well, if you don't trust anyone, then you're untrustworthy because who can trust you? Well, people can trust me. I just don't trust them. That's not how human beings work. <laughs> and if you think that's how human beings work, yeah, you, you're going to have some, some difficulties, you know, in the days of head, but ahead. But I'm saying that to say we are all operating in and through one realm of consciousness so when i say god i have a very different i use the wet that word as a as a focus point so that everybody can kind of at least you know be on the same page but my concept of god is the all everything is god everything is expressing god right god is experiencing this third dimensional reality through us now you know, it, I don't want to go too far left into this because this could be a whole nother video into itself because there's a lot of evil and wickedness going on, right? And so you can say, well, Zaza, is God, you know, experiencing the evil and wickedness? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's these polarities that are at play, positive and negative, upper and lower, right? These polarities are always expressing and the universe has the what I believe is is built-in mechanisms, so that when humanity goes too far into darkness, too far into evil and wickedness, which is where we are now, that there is a divine intervention. But the thing is, human beings have free will, so you can choose to destroy yourself. We see people choosing to destroy themselves every day. You can choose bondage and slavery. And God or any sense of divine consciousness or even the collective consciousness will not intervene unless you want something else for yourself, something more for yourself, right? So being in harmony with the world is the opposite of spiritual density. If you're living ostracized and separated from the world, ostracized meaning it wasn't your intention, you know what I'm saying? Like your family just sort of shut you off because you wouldn't take A, B, or C, right? That's a reality for a lot of people in this, in this world right now. You can be ostracized from your family because of those things, but be in harmony with life and in the world. That's what it's going to take moving forward, right? There's a lot of things that I just will not stand for in my personal life that a lot of other people are going along with, right? I can still be in harmony with nature, though. I can still sit down and meditate and have a deep, substantive con uh, conversation with universal consciousness. I do it all the time. Lack-based consciousness worrying about food shortages, worrying about gas prices, all of these things, which yes, we have to be conscientious of, but if you're operating from your higher self, your inner being, and you understand that there is no such thing as lack on this planet anywhere, <laughs> except man-made lack, then you can you know, subvert that spiritual density, weight loss and weight gain. How many times have you seen somebody where you, they lost a lot of weight and look skinny, but look very unhealthy, right? So, you know, weight loss or weight gain is not just about, you know, being obese or being uh, a heavyweight, so to speak. Heavyweight's not the word I want to use. Uh, you know, being overweight, that's the word. Um, 
we sometimes just automatically think that being overweight is necessarily, you know, a reflection of unhealthiness, which it usually is. But when it comes to spiritual density, you know, there's there's caveats because depending on uh, you can be a, a high vibrational being in terms of meditation and prayer and mindset and energy, and maybe be a little bit more dense physically, right? So there's layers and caveats to this. It all depends on your upbringing, um, your life experience, and, and where you are in this particular moment. Um, and then a loss of spark for life. If I've done 300 consultations in the last, since 2021, which that's a probable number, um, of those 300 people, I would say about 65% of them said that they were lost. They didn't really know, you know what I mean? Their purpose in life, what they wanted to do, you know, didn't really know what their purpose and divine meaning of their life was, right? This is because they've lost track of the creative force. We're here to create. And people don't, you know, a lot of people have given up on this idea of just working to pay bills. And, you know, you, you born, you get a white picket fence, the house with a white picket fence and a, you know, a two car garage and a car, you pay bills, you send your children off to college and then you die with hopefully, you know, with life insurance, right? Well, a lot of people have given up on that. It's not attractive to them. It doesn't feel good, right? But they don't have anything that they're passionate about or that they feel creative about. This creates spiritual density. Spiritually becoming spiritually light looks like cultivating life force energy and chi, which goes back to your breathing, right? Uh, immersion in a subject that you love, which is also a form of meditation, as well as the regular ways we think of meditating. Um, developing a spiritual physical practice. For me, yoga is life. I cannot stress the value and the benefit and the beauty of yoga. Um, but I also know, you know, that some people don't have the temperament for yoga. Some people use running as a spiritual, physical practice. For other people, it's karate, martial arts, I should say. Um, and, you know, that goes beyond just, you know, learning how to kick and throw punches. There is a lot of spiritual connotation to martial arts when it's taught the proper way, right? Um, Wing Chun, for instance, is a, is a very feminine you know, practice of martial arts. So yeah, you can learn how to, you know, throw punches and kicks and whatnot. But if you really want to become a master of the craft, you have to be a master of the feminine aspect of your nature, whether you're a man or a woman. Cultivating harmony and connection with nature, obviously vitamin D, um, the pineal gland is a whole other subject. Um, you know, the crystallization of the pineal gland. We have crystals when your pineal gland is operating at a high capacity. It is surrounded by crystal-like forms. But when the pineal gland is calcified, it becomes dense and those crystals are calcified or neutralized, right? Well, when they're crystallized and when the pineal gland is operating at a high capacity, this is when, you know, that third eye uh, chakra kicks in and we are operating with a deeper sense of connection to the spiritual bodies and to nature and to the universal consciousness. Um, and then your desires are how God communicates to and through you. I heard somebody say that, and I can't remember who it was. Um, it was a while ago. And it was so powerful that I was in my car and I just kind of jotted it down. And then, you know, went on with my day or whatever, but it makes perfect sense for me. Your desires are how God communicates to and through you. So my desire as a writer has been to put out content that can help people understand how we got to the place that we are, you know, as a culture and, and as human beings, a scientific war that, you know, Eight years ago, I was writing about this and didn't realize how much of a, of a magnitude 
um, this particular subject matter was going to become in the world, right? This was God, that yearning and that love for knowledge and research and data and information. That was God speaking and communicating to and through me. This is what's going to be needed on the planet. And it's something that I love to do. So it's, you know, covering both bases, something that I love to do and something that the world actually needs right? My desire to purchase land and my desire to cultivate land. I always, when I, when I went to college initially, I was in college for architecture. I changed my major to interior and architectural design, but I've always had a passion for design. I've always had a love for buildings and, and how spaces are functional and how they're created and how land is cultivated. And now look where we are, right? So God has my desire of cultivating land, of building spaces and of beautifying spaces is how God has been communicating to and through me. That is spiritual. When I, when I focus in those areas, that's what allows me to be light spiritually. Physical density. I mean, here we have, you know, some bacon and some burgers, beef, clearly, that don't look like turkey. Um, if you're eating like this, you know, your, your, your body is going to be dense. Your mind is going to be dense. You know, it's hard to connect with the ethers on a spiritual level when you have uh, 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 fast foods and very unhealthy things kind of sitting in your gut, you know what I mean? Waiting to be flushed out. And it'll probably never be fully flushed out because you aren't taking any herbs or any supplements to help with that flowing process. Right. And then also going back to what I said before, weight loss and weight gain. You can be super skinny or you can be obese. That doesn't mean, you know, and be physically dense from both of those vantage points. Shallow breathing again. You know, if you're walking around breathing through your mouth, first of all, your nose is the apparatus to take breath in because you have filters, which are your nose hairs that are cleaning and detoxifying you know, the air when you take it in through the nose. And then when you breathe, if you breathe out through the nose or through the mouth, you are expressing those toxins. So your blood has a whole process of cleansing itself that is dependent on your breathing process. So if you breathe shallow, your body is naturally going to be acidic because you aren't even giving all of your organs and your blood and your neurological system including the pineal gland, the right proper levels of oxygen. Bad posture is physical density. And you should remember that wherever you are right now, however you're sitting, if you're sitting hunched over, right? Your body, it's a way, it's sort of like your body saying, oh, I'm tired of this. I don't wanna be here. I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. Now you might not be thinking that, but your body is expressing discomfort with bad posture. That is a turnoff to me. If I see a man, I don't care how fine he is or you know, how intelligent he is. If I see a man sitting hunched over like a little elf, you know what I'm saying? Or, or it, just, it, just, it just, it resonates as density. It resonates, it resonates as weighty. You know what I'm saying? Like you got the world on your shoulders, right? And a lot of people who are, you know, on computers a lot, um, on their phones a lot, you know, are just the, the way that this world is, is kind of created, it reflects bad posture. The, the shoes reflect bad posture. The way the shoes are created, high heels for women. I mean, the, you know, that's another conversation, but I've had my, you know, issues my body reacting very badly to wearing high heels nonstop for, you know, six or seven years. And I'm tall. So, you know, it probably has a different, you know, uh, um, effect on me, but I'm just saying, stop wearing high heels. I still wear high heels, but rarely. Um, and focusing on yoga. Now my posture, when you see me, I'm very upright. When I sit, if I hunch, it feels uncomfortable. Like my body is trained now to kind of sit in a, in a erect, uh, uh, upright posture. 
um, cluttered house cars and spaces. That is a very physically dense situation. And you know, because when you walk through the door, it feels like, ugh. You get in somebody's car that is is junky and that has stuff all, all over the place. Yeah, that's physical density. That affects how you think and how you're feeling. Your work environment, acidic-based food diet. That goes without saying, right? And then, you know, if you know anything about the pH system, which I talk about in my ebook, Practical Steps to Health and Well-Being. But if you understand how the pH of the body works, you know, you can't be too acidic and you can't be too alkaline. Your body needs a neutral sort of, you know, space to be in, in order to flourish. We live in an acidic world. So we need to increase our uptake of alkaline, you know, foods, alkaline drinks, as well as alkaline herbs and supplements. Limited physical mobility. I mean, we're here to move, you know, that's why, you know, metaverse and people wearing goggles to have pleasure is so dangerous because if your body is not, if you're not being continuously physical mobile, you are, con you're continuously losing. It's like, if you don't use it, it starts to not work. You know what I mean? And when you do yoga, you really start to experience and realize how much of your body you neglect because you don't use it or you don't pay attention to it, you know? Um, and then continuous sickness and disease. Becoming light physically looks like cultivating life force energy or chi, developing a spiritual physical practice, body and breath cohesion, which man, sometimes I'm doing yoga, I get in a zone and I, I just feel like I'm flying, like just the best feeling in the world. Cultivating harmony and connection with nature, going back to what we talked about, vitamin D, fasting, which I cannot stress enough. Next fast I'm doing is a three-day fast this coming weekend. If you guys want to join, I'm going to post to, um, you know, to invite everybody. But for me, fasting is, is so necessary, especially in these times. It just improves mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically every aspect of, of your reality. And then challenging yourself physically. Like, man, I, I just, you know, I've always been athletic but I've always just, I like to be challenged. You know what I'm saying? So I need to hike a mountain every now and then. Some, when I'm on my game, I hike twice a week, you know, but I can't go too long without, you know, hiking and challenging myself physically. And, you know, my yoga practice, you know, most I, I'm okay with, you know, doing challenging practices, but every now and then I try something physically in yoga that, you know, <laughs> if I'm not careful, I could get hurt. You know, I'm trying to stick my inversions and my headstands and whatnot. Um, and I haven't been consistent with my practice in that, but I'm still like challenging myself physically. So the body is a, is a, is a great tool for expansion, um, but you have to challenge yourself consistently. Emotional density looks like this picture. <laughs> Being everywhere and nowhere at the same time. I'm all over the place. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a woman say that to me. I'm all over the place. I said, I don't know what to do. Well, first of all, stop. So emotional density looks like weight loss and weight gain. Again, shallow breathing, bad, bad posture, cluttered house, car spaces, erratic mood swings, being all over the place, inability to communicate in a healthy way, and then also cancerous cells and disease. If you're sitting around you know, emotionally sabotaging yourself, uh, beating yourself up all the time, your cells are taking that as a, it, it, it's having the same effect on your cells, your internal body. Oh, I hate myself. I'm so mad at myself for doing this. Well, your body hears you and feels you saying, I hate you. I don't like you. You know what I'm saying? I feel sick. So go ahead and be sick anyway. Right. Man, we're so much deeper and so much complex and so much powerful than what we realize. And so many people are living in this kind of basic, substantial, uh, substandard way of life. So becoming light emotionally looks like this picture. <laughs> I, I can't be mad when I'm at the beach. I might go to the beach with, with you know, upset or, or frustrated about something, but just looking at the water and understanding how big and how vast this planet and the universe it is, it is, it always bring me, brings me back to the center, but 
being light, becoming light emotionally looks like going back to the wonderment of life. When's the last time you felt wonderment? Like you could fly, tapping into the imagination. Yes, the imagination is a pinnacle of your emotional uh, countenance. We're here to create, right? So if you're creating, expressing the imagination, creating it in your mind first, then attaching the feeling to it, then going out into the world and having the experience make manifest, that's the power of God working through you. Not taking things personally, because guess what? Everybody's going through some shit. I can assure you of that. And that's easier said than done, obviously. Um, studying your habits and your moods starting to understand why you get triggered by certain things. Most of the things that trigger you have nothing to do with whatever is in front of you. And it takes you back to a childhood or a, you know, a negative relationship or an experience that you kind of got emotionally stuck in, right? Uh, giving life to the creator in you and then clearing stagnant energy. So contraction versus expansion. Expansion feels like freedom. Expansion feels like growth. Expansion feels like climbing or, you know, traveling or walking or swimming or yogaing or running or creating evolving, feeling, thinking, not from a lack-based consciousness, but like nothing is impossible. Like I can do that. <laughs> I want that. I'm going to get it, right? Those are expansive thoughts, expansive ways of thinking and living. The contraction, which is where the density comes in, is shrinking. It's making yourself small. It's making yourself disappear. I, um, let me see if I can find this name on my phone because I posted this in my story the other day, but it was just so powerful. Um, this brother, Mr. Jason Wilson, who I follow on um, Instagram, he said, a man who has to walk on eggshells to keep peace will eventually become so skilled at it that he makes no sound in life. So walking on eggshells is contraction staying in relationships that are unhealthy and dysfunctional is contraction. You'll never be able to grow and expand to your highest heights if you're in a relationship with a person that continuously makes you feel small or unimportant. Staying at a job that you hate when you have goals and aspirations that go way beyond anything that you do at this job that's just paying your bills is contraction. Doing something that you hate because the world tells you that you're supposed to, or because your family told you, you know, we are, we're all doctors. So we're, you're the next doctor in line. So you spend 10, 10 years or 20 years or 30 years doing something that you absolutely hate. And everybody in the world thinks it's, it's so wonderful and amazing and great accomplishment. And yet on the inside, every single day, you die a little more. That's contraction. That's not operating from a spiritual heart-based function. That's operating from a fear-based, lack-based capacity. What will my parents think? What will my family think? What will the world think, right? So I really wanna emphasize to everybody that takes the time to listen to this, make sure that you're expanding in your relationship with your significant other, in your relationship with your family, in your relationship with your children. A lot of parents get stuck in a, in a, in a time war because parenting is all they know how to do and then their children go off to college and then they completely forget that they had goals and dreams and aspirations and have no idea where to start because they feel like they're 18 years, you know, or however many years behind the eight ball, right? So expanding is living from a heart-based consciousness. Expanding is determining and fine tuning and deciding what your goals and aspirations are. If you don't know, well, that's the job to figure it out. 
creating. I have written two books, four workbooks, one textbook on the way. And it feels, it's the most wonderful feeling in the world. When I go from a concept, I'm gonna write a workbook, keys to womanhood, what every young girl should know. It was just an idea in my mind. And, and uh, through all the processes of the, the, through all of the levels of the creative process, when the book arrives in my hand and I can feel it and I can comb through the pages and I can see the, you know, where I was at when I, when I at that day when I wrote that page. And, oh, I remember what happened that day when, when I finished that chapter, right? Physical, tangible creativity. And it can be a book or it can be a vision board or it can be a car. You know, I was having a conversation with a friend the other day about electrical cars. And I was saying, if we can create electrical, if cars can be run electrically by just plugging them up through electricity and solar power energy can create electricity, then there has to be a way to create cars that can run solely from the electricity of the sun. Who's creating that? Who's even thinking about creating that? You know, we're facing this new era of this technocracy and these people using technology against us. And, you know, yeah, that's the plan. But how many people that are actually in IT that operate in, you know, the computer world that does coding and computer systems, how many people are trying to create gateways for people to have access to the internet and access to this world, regardless of what, you know, the quote unquote powers that used to be what their agenda is, instead of just warning everybody about what they're planning. Well, if you have a, a expertise in that field, then we, we would hope that you would also be looking for ways or methodologies or solutions for us to get around that. Cause you know, <laughs> that's where my mind is at right now, building a, a world beyond this world, right? So contraction versus expansion. So the sovereignty of self, how to thrive in times of uncertainty is a 90 day course of exploration for women only. Please join myself and 10 other like-minded women on a journey of introspection to fall in love with life. Again, you'll have an initial 30 minute consultation with me to identify your personal goals. We'll have a monthly live group meeting and workshop. Our, um, We'll have catered monthly exercises and projects based on your personal goals. You'll have access to an online community group for socialization and group interaction. So I have a, a Facebook version uh, on my website or a version of Facebook on my website um, that will be private for the members of the group only. And then you'll also have access to my library of workshops and all of my content on my website. Um, I'm gonna put a link below and you can fill out the uh, information uh, request, your name and your email address, and we will email you the information in order to access the, um, the information for the course. <clears throat> so click the link below if you're interested. Again, women only, we have 10 spaces available. Once that 10 sells out, the next course will launch on June 25th of 2022. And I'm gonna leave you guys with this quote from one of my Bibles. One of my favorite books by John Randolph Price, The Super Beings. He says, the mystics, the super beings, have found 12 God powers within man. The power of love, the power of wisdom, the power of understanding, the power of authority, the power of strength, the power of order, the power of faith, the power of forgiveness, the power of enthusiasm, the power of imagination, and the power of will. These powers are etched deeply in the soul of each individual and must be stirred into action if man is to regain his rightful position in the divine scheme of things. Every single one of us is implementing or operating or dealing in all of these different powers on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of us are creating the flow and some of us are going with the flow meaning that someone else's power of understanding or someone else's willpower is influencing the way that you live your life. So going with the flow versus creating the flow is what this course is about. 
info at zazaali.com is my website. And um, let me know if you guys have any questions. I'll see you soon. Peace and love.